My name is Mike Van Meter. I'm the teaching pastor here at Foothills Church. And um, I was, I've been working on my message. I'm preaching this weekend here, and so I've been just working really hard, kind of head down. And then this morning I thought, I better probably go listen to Chris Brown and Chris Hilkins' messages just to make sure, you know, like we're not, I'm not saying the same thing as them. And I, I came away with a couple um, observations. First off, uh, they both said how old they were. Uh, Chris Brown said he's 53 years old. And I just thought, like, you, gross, you know, old. <laughs> and then Chris Hilkins said he's 34. And I thought, like, are you even old enough to be running a church? Like, I'm not sure <laughs> what's going on here. And then, I thought, you know, I'm 44, so I feel like I'm, like, right in the middle, like, kind of the sweet spot, <laughs> kind of perfect. So um, that was good. Um, actually, I remember the first time I ever uh, saw Chris Hilkin speak, I was uh, on vacation. It was several years ago, lots of years ago, and I was up at uh, North Coast. Um, we were, well, I was up in Del Mar, and we were going to find a church to go to. For, and I said, let's go to North Coast. I'd love to hear Chris Brown speak. And I got there, and they got up, and they said, yeah, our junior high pastor is going to be speaking this morning. And I saw, like, boo, you know? <laughs> I'm a junior high pastor, which makes that extra funny. I, you know, I spent 20 years as a junior high pastor. And, um, and then he just got up there and like just slowly over the message, I was kind of like, oh, okay, all right, you're a pretty good speaker, you know? Um, and so I, I was just really impressed with him. And so it's been cool just to see God use both of those guys and both those ministries and that they would even be here um, uh, preaching to us. I hope you felt really blessed and honored. I know I, I felt blessed and honored by him. But what I did realize after watching both of their messages is basically God is trying to get someone in here's attention because I have a lot of very similar things to say that you have already heard, okay? So um, my message this, this evening is really centered on suffering. And that's exactly what Chris Hilkin spoke on last night. And um, kind of the the, the depth of the upper call of God uh, is kind of what Chris was speaking on on um, the first night. And so I just feel like, I don't know if something bad's going to happen to you in here, you know, or you need to be on the lookout, but maybe, you know, uh, so watch your back. Okay. <laughs> uh, suffering is not something that this is it's like, not something I preach on often. It's not something we preach on a lot. It's not something that just gets preached on the church because we really, the honest truth is we don't really like to think about suffering, to talk about suffering. And, and we're kind of privileged in the way that living in modern life, like we just don't have to worry about suffering quite as much as most people from the, from, you know, the rest of history. Uh, my degree is in history, and so I've done a fair amount of like studying other cultures and other times. And if you gave me the choice between being me in my life here in 2023 or being a king or an emperor or a czar at any other time in world history, I would pick me right here in 2023. And the reason I pick me is for things like air conditioning. Uh, um, uh, we have like, like athleisure wear, right? Like they just like flick sweat away from your body, you know? Um, like, like I would take whatever Nike just came out with this year versus, you know, what a king was wearing 200 years ago and before. Um, I have this, I have a refrigerator in my house and it has a little window in it and I can come take a cup and I can push it in the window and it will like ice will go into the cup. That's never happened before. You know, um, we have indoor plumbing where we push a button or do a lever and just, it just disappears. Like we never have to think about like, like the, the, our bodily excrements. I don't know. I wasn't planning on saying that word tonight. So I'm sorry about that. Um, you know, think about your bed, right? Like you can, you know, I mean, probably not you guys, but once you make some money and you're old enough to buy a good bed, like you could buy one of those beds where you decide which number is your most comfortable number to sleep on, right? Nobody was ever doing that previous to this. Um, things like antibiotics, Netflix, um, Home Depot, right? Amazon. Like uh, Home Depot, if you go to Home Depot right down the street and, and you need a screw, you can go to their hardware aisle and you can pick, do you want a quarter inch screw? Do you want an eighth inch screw? Do you want a 16th inch screw? What kind of screw do you want? What kind of head do you want? What kind of color do you want it, right? A hundred years ago, if you wanted a screw, you'd go to the woods. You'd have cut down a tree and get a branch and whittle a screw out of it. That's how you got a screw back in those days. <coughs> and we live very comfortably lives, very comfortable lives. In, in ways that we largely are unaware of some of the hard things that have been just the most normal part of life for most people in the history of the world. And, and, and it has done something a little bit weird to us. 
it has caused us to really have, in, I think in some ways, avoid suffering at all costs. So many of us, one of our primary goals of our life is to be comfortable, to have a nice life, to be comfortable. And, you know, one, there was a good illustration of this. Um, in the Olympics several years ago uh, in Brazil, there was a story where when you flew into the Brazil airport, right when you left the airport, you would travel along the stretch of road that had just this beautiful, ornate wall that they had built for the Olympics. And it was just kind of like this really amazing thing. But what you didn't know is if you had come six months earlier, the wall wasn't there. And what's on the other side of the wall is 13 of the worst flavelas in all of, of Rio de Janeiro. A favela is, is like a slum. It's where the poor people live. And so they built this wall so you wouldn't have to, look, all the visitors coming from all the world wouldn't have to look at their poor people. Wouldn't have to look at the suffering or the, 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 the squalid conditions that people were living in. And so many of us, that's how we live our lives. And sometimes that has seeped into the church. It has seeped into our theology. Now, you guys aren't old enough to remember this, but at one point in, in our history in the United States, we used to have something called a Christian bookstore, okay? They're all gone now. And thank God for it. Because if you had gone into a Christian bookstore, what you would have found is you would have found about 10% of the store is books, okay? And of those books, about 60% of them are garbage. About 40% are okay, but the rest of the store was filled with like tchotchkes, like, like little angels and, and doormats and, and coasters and like all kinds of random crap that old ladies would put up in their house or signs that people would put on their house. And it, it would have all the, the common verses like Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, plans for your good, not to harm you. And it, it, it kind of had this, this very comfortable, center, God loves you, has a great plan for your life, which is, which is true as far as it goes, but it's not the only part that's true. And, and left to itself, it's kind of like, okay, you can just have sort of a shallow, uh, uh, self-centered Christianity, but its worst part, it's, it's given birth to what has is, is become called the, the, the prosperity gospel, or health and wealth prosperity gospel, that, that God is primarily concerned with making your life good, with making you healthy and you wealthy and you having a really great life. It's a damnable heresy. It's centered on man and not God. It's not biblical. But most of all, it is unhelpful for you in your life in the times particularly when you are going to encounter real difficulty, real pain, real suffering. Jesus and Christianity is not some superficial band-aid that you can put over your life or paper over your house in order to make everything, all your problems go away and make everything good. Christianity is a hard-as-nails religion. It's a, it's a worldview that answers everything, even the deepest, most difficult questions of life. It, it, it accounts for all the good and all the bad, all the pain, all the peace, and all the tribulation. So this morning, this evening, usually when I'm preaching, it's in the morning. This evening, I want to look at the book of Job. We're going to look at the entire book of Job, okay? <laughs> I think there's 40 chapters in Job, 39 chapters in Job, something like that. Should know, I'm preaching on it. Let's, 42? 42 chapters in Job. And Job is one of the wildest books of the Bible, okay? And so we're going to try to, we're going to, try to look at at the, the main parts of Job. This is a four-week study that I did with, with my home group, and I've kind of broken it down into just one main um, a sermon, and that's what I want to talk about tonight. The first verse of Job, Job 1.1, sets up the, the scenario that we're going to enter into. It says, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. Right away, we get the picture zoomed in on Job, and we find out that Job is a godly, upright, blameless, righteous man who feared God and he avoided evil. In the, in the next couple of chapters, we're going to find out, in the next couple of verses, we're going to find out that God had blessed Job, that God was pleased with Job, that Job and God had a tight relationship, and that God was blessing the hand of Job's uh, um, Job's hand as he, as he labored, and that God made him wealthy and powerful, that God had given him uh, a large family, seven sons, three daughters, and his, he was blessing him. But then in verse 6, we get a total curveball, and I want to just look at it because it is so 
wild that if it wasn't in the Bible, you'd have a hard time convincing me that it was true. Job 1, 6 says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From roaming about on the earth and walking around on it. Now, I think I had always kind of understood the relationship between God and Satan to be like where Satan was like a fugitive on the run and that that God was looking for him. And as soon as God found him, Satan was going to be in big trouble. But the, the setup here in the book of Job is that when God says, come, Satan comes. There's no running or hiding from God. And I guess that makes sense. But it says he calls his angels before him and he invites also Satan to come before him. And Satan comes and he says, where do you come from? He says, I come from roaming around about the earth and walking around on it. Now, Satan is the father of lies, okay? So everything he's ever going to do is a little, a little shifty, a little shady, okay? So it's certainly true that he's walking around the earth. We know that because the Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 8, Be sober and vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And so it's true that he was walking around on the earth, roaming around, but he's roaming around seeking people to destroy, seeking God's handiwork to undermine, to try to tear down, to try to rip off, to try to destroy and try to kill those particularly the Imago Dei, those people who are made in the image of God. Now, you got to remember, though, there's something else interesting here, that, that God's not like us. God is omniscient. He knows everything. And so when you come to a part in the Bible where God asks a question, it should make you stop and think, well, what's that about? Because the, he doesn't ask questions for the same reason we ask questions. We ask questions because there's information we don't know and we want to find something out. God asks questions. He knows the answer already. He's trying to do something else. And he's initiating something here that is so wild. Look at the next verse. Then the Lord said to Satan. Say, the Lord said to Satan. The Lord said to Satan. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job For there is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. What is crazy, and we have to keep in view here for the rest of this discussion and all of our understanding about Job, is that it was God who brought Job into this situation. It was God who brought up Job's name to Satan. Now, God knows exactly who Job is. He says it right here. He's he's righteous and he's blameless. There's no one like him. God also knows who Satan is. God knows that Satan is wicked and vile. He's a rebel and he wants to destroy everything that is good, certainly Job included. And yet God says, have you considered my servant Job as you're walking around the earth seeking whom you may devour like a roaring lion? Have you considered Job? There's no one like him on the earth. And then Satan answered and said, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge about him in his house and all that he has on every side? You bless the work of his hand. His possessions have increased in the land. It says that, that God, you have put such a protection and so many blessings on Job. Of course, he's going to love you. Of course, he's going to be righteous. Of course, he's going to be upstanding. But he's only doing it because of what you do for him. But put forth your hand now and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not put forth your hand on him. So Satan departed from the presence of the Lord. God gives him permission to do harm to Job. He just gives him one rule. He said, everything he has in your power, just don't put your hands on him. Just don't touch Job. And if God gave permission to Satan to do his worst, you can bet that Satan's going to do his worst. 
And this whole story is given to us, at least in part, to help us understand something deep about suffering, something deep about why bad things happen, something deep about why we go through hard things. And what's interesting about this, this scenario is that Job has no idea about this conversation. He has no idea what was happening in the spiritual world. He has no idea about the conversation that happens between Satan and God. And we come to verse 14. It says, A messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them, and the Sabians attacked and took them. They also slew the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he's still speaking, another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And while I was still speaking, another came and said, The Chaldeans formed three bands and made a raid on the camels and took them and slew the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, another also came and said, Job, your sons and your daughters were eating and they were drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they died. And I alone have escaped to tell you. And in the course of a minute, everything that Job had ever hold dear, held dear was ripped from his hands. And most tragic of all was the death of his children. The Bible tells, tells us that Job was a loving father. I'm sure he would have gladly given every camel, every sheep, everything that he had, all the gold, all the money, for his children, and yet they were all taken too. Now listen, this isn't a contest, but if we were going to have a contest and everybody here was going was to um, lay out all the hard things that you've been through in your life, it is likely that at the end of your life that no one in here, almost certain that no one in here is going to encounter the kind of deep suffering that Job is going through. You might, you will lose people who are dear to you. You will suffer disappointment in life. You'll probably get fired from a job. You'll probably get falsely accused of something. You likely are to have, it's likely somebody's going to break your heart. It's likely somebody you're going to put your trust in is going to hurt you. But it is unlikely that you will know the kind of suffering that Job here knows. And for reasons that are completely unknown to Job, the protection and the blessing that he's experienced for his entire life is gone. You know, one of the, one of the reasons that God lets us suffer is because of this cup. I borrowed this uh, tumbler from a girl backstage from the worship team, Matt's wife, Lauren. And uh, I don't understand these. Like, people spend a crazy amount of money on these and collect them. And you see people with like 50 of them. And then sometimes they're like trying to resell them to us. Get out of here with that. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, it's just water. It's fine. She didn't like that. Um, but, you know, the, the, the funny thing about it is that, that we spend all this money on these cups. But a cup, the purpose of a cup is like what's inside the cup. But it's a little bit of an illustration of how just we generally do life. Like, you know, we, we spend a lot of time worrying about what the outside looks like, trying to make the outside look good. But the thing that's really valuable about you, the thing that is really important about who you are is, is really what's on the inside. And, and the, one of the things that suffering does, one of the, things that, that one of the reasons that suffering is helpful is because when you get jostled, when you get pushed, what's inside the cup comes out. And it's actually a good time to find out what's really inside. And sometimes it's hard to know what's really inside until something happens that forces it out. And one of the things that forces us to, to come to terms with what's on the inside of us is suffering. Let's see what's on the inside of Job. Job 1, 20, verse 20. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head, and he fell to the, down to the ground, and he worshiped. He said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I, sh I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And through all of this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. 
Job, all your camels are gone. Job, all your sheep are gone. Job, all your livestock is gone. Job, all your money is gone. Job, your children have been killed in a freak accident. All of your servants, everything you have is gone. And in the moment of the deepest despair, Job's response is to get down on his knees. And what comes out of him is worship to the Lord. What comes out of his heart in his, in his most disorienting pain, in his deepest confusion, in him not knowing or understanding, is not rage against God. It's not hatred. It's not bitterness. It's not revenge. It's not depression. It's not anxiety. But it is a contrite heart that recognizes that his only hope is in the Lord. The Bible says that he bows his face, he tore his robe, he shaved his head, and he fell down to the ground and he worshiped. What came to Job's mind in the moment when he had no idea what he should think was worship. That doesn't just happen. My kids are, um, two of my boys, my two oldest boys are, in uh, baseball right now. And uh, my, my middle son is in, um, uh, I guess it's not minors. What's below minors? Caps? I don't know. It's like the one with the pitching machine. But like they, they're still not good. Like they're still bad. And so they have the pitching machine. And so like if a kid gets a hit, everybody swarms to the ball. Like like, it's not like that's, that's that guy's position. It's like, no, no, I got it, you know? And so it's like five kids all tumble around on each other. And, um, and what, they're, what they're doing is they just spend a bunch of time practicing really basic fundamental baseball. Like, just catch the ball, throw it to first, right? That's, they spend a ton of time working on that. And what's crazy is tonight, <coughs> the Padres are in Arizona. Fernando Tatis' first game back from like, uh, like a year and a half off. And, um, and, you know, if you watch the Padres or the, or the, um, the Diamondbacks in the, between innings, do you know what they're going to do? The exact same thing my son is doing on his little baseball team at Lakeside National Little League. They're going to field ground balls. They're going to throw it to first. They've been doing it. They've, they've been doing this in their entire lives. These guys are 30-year-old baseball players. Manny Machado is 30 years old. He's, he's still, between innings, going to field the ball, throw it to first. What are they doing? They're doing what, what all, if you've ever been an athlete of any kind, what you do when you practice is you're just drilling fundamentals. You're just drilling the basics. You're just doing it over and over and over again. And they're not like, I'm sick of this. When do we get to do the big league stuff? This is the big league stuff, right? And, and so often what we don't understand is, is that, that worship is something that is not just like we do it when it feels good or we do it for whatever. It's something that we want to be fundamental to our life. Because there's going to come times in your life when you're not going to know what to do. You're not going to know where to go. You're not going to know what the answer is. You're going to be so disoriented because of pain or because of suffering or because of some disappointment or some struggle. And you want your reflexes, you want your mind to go to where you have practiced. And that's where Job's mind went. That's where Job's heart went. I don't know where to go. But his body knew where to take him to worship the Lord, to do it automatically. You know, it's common for people to turn to God in the midst of difficulty or struggle or tribulation. There's a, there's a chart that they have on when people are the most open to the gospel. And all the top things on the chart are like really terrible things, like the death of a child, the death of a spouse, a divorce. And these are times when people are open to hearing about God. But I want to tell you, there's actually something very difficult at the same time about going to God in the midst of pain. When your question is why this feels unfair, this doesn't seem right, I don't understand, it's very difficult to learn to trust God in that moment. You want to have a trusting relationship with God in, in your everyday life, fundamental, foundational to who you are, that believes in trust in God, that looks to God. A.W. Tozer says, what comes to our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. 
In Job 121, Job says, The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Remember Satan's accusation? Of course he worships you, God. It's because you give him all this good stuff. You know that when we talked in the beginning about just why we don't like to talk about suffering and we don't like to talk about pain is because we, we, we have oftentimes allowed ourselves to put trust in God's blessings and his comfort. God wants good things for me. I'm going to trust him because he gives me good things. But what if he doesn't give you good things? Then do you trust him? Then do you love him? Then do you serve him? The answer for Job is, God, you, you've given and you've taken away. Lord, blessed be your name. So then we get to chapter 2 of Job. We find out the story's not over. In fact, we have almost the exact same situation we did in chapter 1, verse 1 of chapter 2. It says, Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? And Satan answered the same thing, from roaming about on the earth and walking around on it and, and, and destroying Job's life. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? Okay, God. Things aren't going good for Job. Yet God's not done. Have you considered my servant Job? There's no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. And he still holds fast to his integrity, although you incited me against him to ruin him without cause. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin. Yes, all that a man he has, he will give for his life. However, put forth your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he'll curse you to your face. So the Lord Satan said, Behold, he's in your power, only spare his life. So remember, Satan's a liar. He's always going to have some, some comeback, some reason, something. Yeah, yeah, I know I said before that it's because you bless him, put a hedge of protection around him, and give him all these good things, and he still worships you. But the real thing is, if you took away his health, if you took away his, his if, you, if, you know, if you made him sick, he'd curse you to your face. So God says, okay, he's in your power. Just don't kill him. Now, I want you to imagine if, if God let Satan do his worst to you and the only thing that you couldn't do is die, I promise you that it would be worse than death, whatever it is that Satan does to you. It would make you long for death. And that's exactly what happens. Verse 7, And Satan went out of his presence of the Lord, and he smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took a potsherd to scrape himself while sitting there among the ashes. Sickness is a different kind of suffering than sorrow. You know, sorrow tends to be external. Sorrow tends to be what Job went through in chapter 1 where your things are taken for you and things aren't going well for you and you're brokenhearted. But sickness is kind of a different kind. It's internally, you can't escape it. When your body is broken, it's so easy to get demoralized. It's so easy to get um, just so discouraged with life. You know, even when you lay down, you can't forget your problems for a minute. You can't even remember back when it was so good. It's like, it's like it, full, it fills your brain. Yeah, just whatever, that's fine. <laughs> just kidding, bro. Yeah. And so here's Job his ash heap of, a, of his life in immeasurable pain, festering sores all over his body. He's got this little piece of pottery and he's, he's cutting open his, his oozing, pussing boils all over his body just to relieve the pressure. And there's only one person left in Job's corner and that's his wife. And then that's going to go bad too. It says, then his wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. Where do we get that language before? Curse God and die. That's what Satan said that Job was going to do. You can bet that, that Satan's in the midst of getting his wife to turn on him. Why are you holding fast to your integrity? Why don't you just curse God and get out of this and kill yourself? But Job said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. 
And Job learned a trick that some of us guys have learned. No, 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 no. I didn't say you were crazy. <laughs> I said you were acting crazy, <laughs> right? No, I, I didn't say you were one of the foolish women. I say you're speaking as one of the foolish women. <laughs> Shall we indeed accept good from God, not accept adversity? And all this God did not, Job did not sin with his lips. Job did not harden his heart. Job 13, 15, Job says, though he slay me, I will hope in him. Though he kill me and put me to death, I will trust him with my life. And even in his deep pain, fear, frustration, this goes on for months. Job did not harden his heart to God. There's always a temptation to reject God, to justify ourselves, to become disillusioned, to shut down your soul, to embrace bitterness, anger, and pride. And Job doesn't. He holds fast to his integrity. He wasn't following God for the blessings or the success or the health. He was blessing God because he's worthy to be worshipped. But then there's a third test. And you know, with this third test, we don't get a picture of what happened in heaven, but we can almost be certain of what that Satan, the same similar thing happened, that Satan was involved in this because Job looks up from the horizon and through these, these pus-filled, diseased eyes, he sees three figures coming towards him. His friends. Each one from his own place. Eliphaz, the Temanite, Bildad, the Shuhite, and Zophar, the Namathite. And they made an appointment together to come to sympathize with him and comfort him. When they lifted up their eyes at a distance, they did not recognize him, and they raised their voices and wept. And each one of them tore his robe, and they threw dust over their heads toward the sky. And they sat down on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights, with no one speaking a word, for they saw that his pain was great. And if they had left right after that, they would have been better men. But they didn't. That's when the next stage of torment enters in, where they begin to accuse Job. Job, look. There's no way God would let this happen unless you displeased him. You did something, Job. You have some hidden sin. You've despised people. You've done some wrong, and you need to confess it. You need to admit it. You need to just get it off your chest, man. Tell us what it is. And Job's in the situation where he says, I didn't, I can't. I, if I had something to repent of, I would, I would confess it. I'm not holding back. But you know, when you're there and they just didn't relent and just, just there's, there's three iterations of each one of them just going and accusing Job in their different way. And of Job just sitting there bearing it, but then all of a sudden the cracks start to show in Job. And he begins to, to do what he hadn't done up to this point. He begins to assert his own righteousness. He begins to question God. And he says things like in Job 10, 1 through 3, I loathe my own life. I will give full vent to my complaint. I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. I will say to God, do not condemn me. Let me know why you contend with me. Is it right for you indeed to oppress, to reject the labor of your hands, and to look favorably on the schemes of the wicked? Job 13, 3, but I would speak to the Almighty, and I desire to argue with God. Job 23, 2 and 4, even today my complaint is rebellion. My hand is heavy despite my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come to his seat. I would present my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. And Job begins to wonder out loud about God's righteousness, about God's faithfulness. And one thing we have to keep in, in, our, in view here is the one thing we can know for sure is that Job is doing better than we would do. There's no one like him, God said. There's no one righteous like Job. There's no one faithful like Job. But here Job is at the very end. And then we get to chapter 38. And chapter 38 is when the whole story changes. And God appears to Job in a whirlwind, and God begins to question Job. It says, and the Lord answered Job out of the world and said, who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now gird up your loins like a man and I will ask you and you instruct me. Listen, if God ever tells you to gird up your loins like a man, it means you're in trouble. God says, I have some questions for you, Job. You've been asking a lot of questions. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who set its measurements since you know? 
or you stretch the line on it, or what were its bases sunk or it laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Where were you? Job, I tell the water it can come this far and no further. Can you do that? Job, the, 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 the beasts, the, the, the alligators and the, the tigers and the great white sharks and the orcas and the dinosaurs, Job, they would tear you in, to pieces. And yet, Job, they come and cuddle me and sit on my lap. They obey my voice. What do you know about that? Job, I put Pallades in the sky. I tied the belt of Orion. Can you do anything like that? God, Job, I spoke this world into existence. The power of my voice, galaxies and solar systems appeared. What do you know about that, Job? And it's just chapter after chapter of God asking Job these same kinds of questions. Four chapters. And what's remarkable is at no point does God ever give Job any inkling to the answer to his question of why does this happen to me? In fact, his only answer is essentially to say, Job, I'm big and you're small. Job, I judge you, you don't judge me. Job, I'm God, you're not. And I think for some people that sounds so unfair. I think for a lot of people when they first read that, they think, man, God, you say you love Job, why wouldn't you give him an answer? Why don't you explain? I mean, at least tell him there's going to be a book called Job in the Bible and hundreds of millions of people who are going through hard times are going to be encouraged by his story. No, no, he doesn't get that. Explain to him this, you were proving a point in this thing. You had a purpose for Job's life. No, just Job, I'm big, you're small. I have six kids. And one of the things I do with my kids to my wife's frustration is we wrestle like all the time. We wrestle at home in my bed. We wrestle, like if we're wrestling, my wife will leave the room because she's like, somebody's gonna get hurt. I just don't wanna be, but we're wrestling. We wrestle in the living room, on the couch, at the store, like everywhere where we are on the trampoline, we're wrestling all the time, okay? And one thing that, that n- I never do is let them win. <laughs> never. Amen. <laughs> uh, not too long ago, I was arm wrestling my son. He's got both hands, right? And I'm just bam, bam, bam. <laughs> and I had this insight a while ago that, um, that that conversation of like, my dad can beat up your dad, that like most of us have had at some point when we we're kids, the reason that kids are so confident that their dad can beat you, your dad up is because they're like, dude, I don't know your dad. I don't know anything about your dad. But dude, I have felt this man's strength, okay? <laughs> this man has picked me up over his head, spun me around, boom, like just no problem for my dad, okay? This man is Hercules. This man could whoop your dad's behind, no problem, okay? Because I have felt the power of this man. There is something really good about knowing that there is someone who loves you who is much stronger than you. The reality that God loves you and that God is infinitely bigger and better and stronger than you is a deep truth that we need to, we need to plumb the depths of. We need to get that deep in our hearts. We need to experience what it is to experience God's strength and his bigness and his power. And here's these fundamental truths. It's the first is this, is you're small. You're going to see suffering and tribulation in your life that is bigger than you. And one of the things it's going to teach you is it's going to teach you you're not God. You cannot save yourself. You can't control the circumstances of your life. You can't command the universe. Every single one of you is going to die. Every single one of you is going to know pain. Every single one of you is going to know sorrow. It's good for you to think about that. 
The Bible says it's, it's better to go to a house of mourning than a house of feasting. It's better to go to a funeral than it is to a wedding. Because such is the end of every man. It's good for him to know it. I don't care how many, you know, whatever, how many miles you're running every day and, you know, how low your blood pressure is and, you know, how many special Himalayan berries you bought on the internet. They're going to take away the free radicals or whatever. I don't, I don't, you're going to get sick and you're going to die. If you don't get, like, taken out by, a, like, a truck or something or war, you know, like, you're going to, your body's going to break down. It's going to fail you. I saw David at Costco last Monday. It's our day off. And um, he's got that, that good A2 organic milk, right? And I'm like, bro, I make more money than you. How are you affording this A2 <laughs> organic milk, dude? I don't understand. I've got like all these, he's got a bunch of kids to feed. I got a bunch of kids to feed. And I've got like, you know, the stuff that came out of like the old cows, you know, that are like <laughs> the three-legged cows that they keep in the back, you know? <laughs> David's got the good stuff. He blamed you for that, Courtney, just so you know. Uh, but it doesn't matter if you drink the regular gross milk or you drink the, you know, the matrenga milk. <laughs> You're going to die just the same. You're going to die. And, and it's good for you to know that. And you should stop wasting your time trying to control your life and trying to control the circumstances because a lot of us do a lot of that. The second thing is, is, is that he's big. His limitations are not, your limitations are not his limitations. He sees you, he loves you, he's able to save you. Like, this, is, this isn't a message I want you to like, you know, save in a file somewhere for when you're going through a hard time. That's not, this isn't just about that. This is about how you live your life every single day. God, am I really putting my trust in you? Am I really hoping in you? Am I really forsaking everything else and walking by faith? Or am I trying to control my life? It's the blessing of suffering that pushes you towards God and reminds you of your smallness. Charles Spurgeon said, I've learned to kiss the wave that cast me on the rock of ages. And Job at the end you can invite the, van, the, the band up. Job says, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I retract and I repent in dust and ashes. Listen, the right response when you encounter the living God is to say, God, you are God and I'm not. And Lord, for all the ways in my life where I try to act like God, or I try to take control, or try to, I try to make my own will happen, Lord, will you forgive me, God? God, I repent in dust and ashes, God. I don't want to be in control. I don't want to make a life that I want. Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Lord, not what I want, what I need, what's good for me, Lord, but what you want, God, what is pleasing to you. And the way you get there is through repentance and surrender. It's just saying, God, I surrender it to you again, Lord. And this is like every day. The Bible says you have to pick up your cross every day and follow him. What does that mean? What's the image of the cross? It's not your pretty necklace. It's not a decoration on our stage. It's an instrument of death. Every day, you have to crucify yourself. Every day, you have to die again to yourself so that God can raise you up to life with him. And it's a constant thing where it's just like, Lord, I want to lay that down. Lord, I, I surrender again to you. Lord, I want to walk in truth. I want to be faithful to you. Suffering is just one of the ways that God gets us to do it. That God gets us to show us again, hey, you're not that strong, you're not that smart, you're not that good. And so if anything in this conference, what our heart would be is that you would just leave here with a deeper surrender to God in your life. You say, God, I, I, I've done this before. If you're, if you're like me, if you've been a Christian for a while, you've done this a bunch. And that's Okay. A lot of times people feel bad like they, they do it to me. But just again to say, Lord, come and have your way. I renew my life again. I rededicate my life again to you today. And so that's what we're going to do. Let's stand. 
we're going to go in a time of, of worship and we'll probably do a little bit of ministry, but let's just, let's just again give our lives to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm, I'm, I belong to you. My life is yours. I have been crucified with Christ and it's no longer I who lives. It's Christ who lives in me. And this life in the flesh that I'm walking around and I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go to work tomorrow or I'm gonna go see my people, my family, like whatever, like this life I'm doing, I live by faith in the Son of God who died for me. So let's, uh, let's, Let's just, as we, I guess I'll, let me pray for us and then, and then I want us just to kind of be intentional about, about making that declaration, about surrendering to him again. So Father, you are worthy, God. You're big. You're the, you're the king of, every king that's ever lived. You're the Lord over every Lord. Every person who's ever had power in this, in this earth is going to bow their knee to you. You see the big and you see the small. And they're all the same to you. Lord, we want to take shelter, God, in your strength. We want to take shelter in your power. As we, as we enter into worship right now, Lord, I pray, God, that, that you would be made bigger in our minds. Your word says the measure we bring to you is the measure you're going to pour out to us, God. I pray, Father, right now that our capacity to see you and to know you and to walk with you and to enjoy you, Lord, would get stretched, would get enlarged, Lord. Spirit of God, would you come and help us, Lord, in all of our failings and all of our weaknesses and all of our smallness? Would by your grace and by your mercy, Lord, would you come and give us more room for you? Let's worship the Lord.